What's it like going from a stage manager position to almost being James Bond? How was it growing up in the golden age of television? What was it like asking the Queen of England a question for a change? Joe and I have set out to find the answers. This is Call Time with Duke and Joe. All right, welcome to Call Time. Uh, we are joined today by a great guest who is actually quite famous, Mr. Ian Ogilvie. How are you, sir? I'm fine, thank you very much. I'm Good to see you. glad you are here. Um, now, you direct at the American Academy of Dramatic Arts, right? I do, yes, occasionally, yeah. And you directed me in The Importance of Being Earnest. But that was not the first time we met. Do you recall our first interaction? No, Duke, I'm afraid I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually quite glad, glad you do not remember this because it's in the top five most embarrassing moments of my life. You were directing The Man Who Came to Dinner about right. a year or so ago, and I had come to watch it. Fraser Brooks was in your cast, who was a very good friend of mine, and I suddenly got this very sharp pain in my stomach area. I remember it now and, and really I was well, yes. squirming <laughs> in my chair. I was like, I can't stand this anymore. I'm not going to... And you said, you, you, you leaned over and said, do you... Do you, need, do you need to go? Do you need, do you need to get out? And you were very, very nice. I thought you were going to bite my head off. It's like, mm. quit fidgeting in my show. But <laughs> <laughs> no, you were like, you can go to the bathroom if you need. And I, of course, I was sitting in the back row, so I had to go over the front row. I, I, I tried to go around the castle. Everybody in the whole room saw me. Excuse me, pardon me, excuse me, pardon me. Pardon me. Yeah. Excuse I interrupted me. the whole show. And, and there's one of my friends will never let me live it down. That she constantly reminds me about it. Well, you know, it, it's average, probably quite a good exercise for the actors because yeah. those kinds of things happen, you know, in mm -hmm. real life in the theater and little distractions like that. And... Um, I think it's a very good piece of, uh, a, a very good exercise for them to be able to continue <laughs> just, while somebody's cl climbing over chairs. Yeah. But I felt very sorry for you, you yeah. know, because, because these things happen. And uh, mm -hmm. my God, you were much more embarrassed than anybody else. Yeah. Uh, it was, uh, you had a worse time than anybody else. So don't I worry know. about it, it dude. Well, it let just that just be a lesson to you. Go before the show. Yeah, yeah, I like that. <laughs> I don't, think, I don't think it was that kind of problem. <laughs> I think it was one of those things where really something bad had happened. It was, I, I don't know what it was. I had to run to the bathroom yeah, and just, just yeah. calm down. It was, I was, you ruined was, Christmas. How funny. Now I do remember it now. Yeah. I absolutely remember it now. I'm so glad you didn't remember when you were directing. No, no, I didn't. Yeah. <laughs> but this show is not about me. I want to get to talking about you. And let's talk a little bit about where you're from. You're from England and you were born in the time of great turmoil in the war, right? Mm. Yes, I was a war baby. I was born yeah. in 1943. Yeah. Mm. And uh, so you, you were born with bombs being dropped in, in England, right? Yes. And I mean, I like to say things like, I fought the war for people like you. <laughs> and I like to say, you don't know what it's like having bombs falling on you. I don't know what it's like having bombs falling right. on me either. My mom uh, and my, my father insisted that my mother and my sister and me, we were, my, my sister and I were babies, were evacuated to the country. So we went down to a county called Surrey where there really weren't any bombs falling at all. And he stayed in London uh, and did his thing. But So I don't have any recollection, of course, of bombs <laughs> falling. But they were falling while I was alive. Yes, mm, let's say that. They, mm. There you go. But your, your, your family was kind of notorious during the war a little bit, right? Your father was an RAF intelligence officer, mm -hmm. and he got a great compliment from... From, from Churchill, yeah. yeah. Well, not directly. Uh, Churchill always liked hit the reports that ended up on his desk to be very succinct and very, uh, nobody should use long words. They should always just be to the point and very factual and easy to read. And he was always complaining about the bombing reports. And he said, the ones I like are from that chap who wrote today's bombing reports. I like his report. <laughs> and that was my dad who, who had a, a great pride in the way he wrote and spoke English. And, um, and instilled it in me a bit, I hope, because uh, um, he was an economical writer and Churchill only liked economy. He, he always used to say only on one side of a paper, I will not turn a page on a report. I only want it on one side of the paper. Yeah, so he, he, he approved of my father's bombing reports. <laughs> right. Yeah. So when? When did you wake up and decide you were an actor, Ian? Well, both my parents had been actors. Um, mm. After university, or at university, my father, who was at Cambridge, and he was a classical scholar, um, he joined the Footlights, which is the famous Cambridge uh, University's uh, amateur dramatic society. And he was a leading light of the Footlights for about a year. And then at the end of that, when he left university, he decided he'd be a professional actor. 
So he did that for a year. He really went, he went on a long countrywide tour in a play. I don't know what it was. At the end of it, he said he decided that he disliked actors and poverty almost equally, so he <laughs> gave the whole thing up. So he only did it professionally for a year before he said, no, that's enough for me. My mother, on the other hand, was an actress for quite a long time uh, um, until she gave it up, uh, really sort of during the war when she was having babies. And things. Then when my sister and I were grown up, and she was always running off and doing amateur plays, and we said, why don't you go back into the profession? You know, you... So she did. But the wonderful thing was she was trained as a, in the 1920s hmm. where you did certain set moves, like you'd walk across and turn, like you'd do a stage turn. Oh, very stylistic. And she, yes, and she still did this technique, which had kind of, we'd all moved on a bit from then. <laughs> right. So she was very popular in provincial theatres, but she never did anything in the West End or on television. Or anything. But, the, but the old ladies in, in the provinces loved my mother because they recognised what she was doing, that kind of technique that was taught in the 1920s. You know? right. Something it, it, that they remembered. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, now, when she, she toured, though, she tr- toured with... John Mills. Yes, the, the, yes. She she went on a Far East, Middle and Far East tour in the days before airplanes. Well, there were airplanes, but they went everywhere by ship and by train. It was a huge company. They did about eight or nine plays. Um, she was one of the juvenile uh, in the company. The other juvenile was the actor John Mills, and they fell passionately in love and had a raging affair, which was great fun for them. And when they came back, they got married, and they were married for about nine years, no children. And then John Mills met the love of his life, a woman called Mary Haley Bell, who is the mother of Haley Mills and all the others. And um, they separated amicably, and that was that. Then she met my father and got married. But one, in reply to your question about the theatre, yes, they were both actors. So inevitably, it was there, you know. That's, and, um, that, that's where you were bound. Yes. The, you know, do you remember a moment, a particular not moment? Not really, because said, my mother was always doing plays with my sister and me. You know, we were, we were always... Oh, so you didn't have time to notice it. You were in them. Not really, no. 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 <laughs> she kind of wished she had a girl, didn't yeah. she? Yeah. 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 She, well, she already <laughs> had one. Yeah. Wow. She kind yeah. of slipped that in there. <laughs> she did a bit, yeah. yeah. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> you, uh, but she already had one. But but, right. but but I think she yes she I think she'd like to. Really, yeah. mm. I think it was a thing for mothers at that time. My mother, I, I was supposed yeah. to be married to Risa. Right, and I was not. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was my not. mother did things like she'd send me off to my. This is when I was in kindergarten. She would send me off to the um, to the costume parade when everybody had to dress up in costumes. She'd dress me up as a little girl. With a wig and a dress and things. And we all had to get up on the stage and say what we were. I was four. And when it was my turn to get up, I got up and I said, I'm a little girl. And the teacher, who obviously hadn't seen through my disguise at all, said, yes, dear, we know, but what are you supposed to be? <laughs> oh, and that's when I began to think, maybe there's something wrong with this, this scenario. But you eventually, you eventually just had, got fed up with it and you said, no more... No right. more dressing up as little girls, but it didn't work because at my <clears throat> at my school, um, uh, both my schools, I was always playing the girl. Hmm. I was always playing girl. Well, you were almost you almost played Cecily in yes. your first encounter with importance of being earnest. I did. I drew the line there. Uh, <laughs> <You're saying, laughs> no, I, I, I will not. Well, I've done not. so many girls, and, and I think because I did them, because I was quite good at them. Mm-hmm. And because I discovered that actually you could get a lot of laughs, a boy playing a girl, you could get cheap laughs, and I always enjoyed a cheap laugh. <laughs> So I would get cheap laughs as a girl, and and where all the other boys didn't want to play the girls, I said, sure, yeah, I don't mind. And uh, but then finally, I did have enough of it, and my my the masters, my, the teacher said, would you play Cecily? I went, yeah, could I play John or Algy or or even Canon Chasuble? I don't mind. I don't, <laughs> anything, something, you know, anything please. but Cecily. Yeah. Well, this, this, I, I got to ask this question, kind of from for my own edification. You had a great aunt who lived in Louisiana. Yes. Why in the hell did she live in Louisiana? <laughs> She married a man um, uh, whose name I forget now. Um, I think I think I don't really know the answer to your question. <laughs> Great aunts did strange things. Right. Just and, and, you know, the, you know, aunts can be tall, they can be short, they can live in Louisiana, yeah. they can live in so And it's for the aunt to choose. And you know what I'm quoting. I know exactly. What um, you're uh, I don't know why she ended up in in Louisiana. She just did. She was crazy. She was mad as a hatter, apparently. Yeah. Mm. Well, yeah, because I brought that up because when she died, you were able to move away from the country, which your father yes. had loved, yes. back to London, where your mother was much happier to be. Yes, much yeah. happier. Mm. 
And what was your what was your first job in the theater? Was it, was watching your parents? Was that your training, or had you had no training? no no? But both of them, neither of them were acting when I was growing up. Mm. I mean, my father had long given it up, and my mother was busy bringing us up and just putting it on for. Uh, well, I went to drama school, but yeah. before I went to drama school, I um, I got myself a job as a, as a junior assistant, kind of intern, stage manager at the Royal Court Theatre, which is the very wonderful experimental theatre in London. It always put on all, it was always the first to put on Al West, it was the first to put on uh, Harold Pinto, all those plays always start at the Royal Court. It was a very vibrant, extraordinary place, and uh, I got a job there as a student stage manager. Oh, and so, yeah. and, and that, you went, to, was that the only training, or did you have other? No, I then went to RADA after that. To R- oh, yes, that was yes. Cool. and that was a two-year course after that. Mm-hmm. And how was that, what, what, what did you... If you're going to walk away and say, I walked away from RADA with something that really helped me for the rest of my career, what would it have been? Well, I, I don't know, Duke and, 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 and you guys you know, have all been at the Academy, but yeah. <laughs> I don't know how you felt about it, but those two years at RADA were, were the most fun years yeah. I've ever had. Uh, uh, it never, it's never got better. Since then, you know, uh, it's the, the it's a wonderful time. Well, you're mm-hmm. constantly working, and you, you you yeah, you never really get that anymore. Where you're doing no. several shows at once or several scenes at once, and you're working on good, solid yeah. material. Well, yeah, that, that, you yeah, really that are material that's written by, by, by some of the greats. And yeah. you're, you're you're so immersed in it. Yeah, mm-hmm. uh, and, and it's it, a wonderful time uh, at drama school. It's the best time because you can have all the fun and none of the responsibility. And it's a, <laughs> and it's a wonderful time. Really. Well, one uh, other thing you kind of started doing, um, and I'm going to quote you here. You started drumming, and you said, I was self-taught by a bad teacher. Yes. I love that line. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I was the worst drummer in the world, and I, I still am. Um, uh, but I did enjoy it very much, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I, we, used to play, we used to play at dances and things like that late at night, and we was the last band to come on at about 2 o'clock in the morning. They'd call for us. And, yeah, it was a lot of fun. Again, that was all part of the drama school experience, you mm. know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, and and I will quote your book several times throughout this because I, I loved it. I thought it was just brilliant and hilarious. One thing that became hold evident. It up, hold it up, dude. Oh, hold it up. I was gonna, hold it up at the end. I was going to give you a, a, a shout give out. You a, a shout out. But this is Once a Saint. Make sure to pick it up wherever books are sold. It's also electric, so you can see it on your iPad yeah. or your on your iPhone. Or and whatever. you were going to sign this for me. Oh, I will. Before you yeah. leave, please. Yeah. But um. It's a great picture. It, it's it's yeah. It, it, that's that's from um, uh, uh, Three Sisters. No, no, no. It's uh, from Arms of the Man. Arms of the Man. Sergius. Yeah. And Arms Sergius. Of the man. Yeah, yeah. yeah it, it's just. Well, I had a long argument yeah. with my publisher. They said, really want to use that photograph. I said, look, always on the front of autobiographies. You always have those kind of posed black and white photographs, sometimes with a cigarette, you know, those mm. kinds of <laughs> these actor photographs. And I said, I want something where if it's in a book, sh- on a table in a bookshop, bookstore. And there's like five other autobiographies around it. I want people to pick mine up. So right. let's have a silly, funny fi- picture mm-hmm. in, on the cover. So that's why I picked that. Yeah, it, it's like a headshot. Yeah, <laughs> I've read yeah. a lot of biographies, and I and I enjoy biographies. You know, I've read Michael Caine's, yeah. uh, Eric Idle's, but always in the middle of them, I go, why? Why do I care? Like it's a celebrity. Why do I care? I never said that with this. Oh, that's probably cool. because I was so entertained, and that's you will be entertained. Make sure to pick it up. Thank you very much. Yeah. yeah. Um, but but one of the things that became evident when you're talking about your early life is that you seem to like a great deal of self confidence. Yeah. And and how did you overcome that? And do you still battle with that a little bit today? I mean, we all have our. I think, uh, all actors have. All that. actors have that. But mm. but what was? How did you jump over that hurdle? Was it Rada who helped you or? Um, no, I don't think Rada helped me very much with that. I have to say that a lot of the lack of self-confidence is slightly mm-hmm. fake. <laughs> um, what I hate is, I hate people who boast or evade mm-hmm. and, and, and think themselves are better than other people, or they, they have some kind of wonderful talent they don't really have. And the tone of the book is purposely slightly self-deprecating. Right. Um, one of the critics said one of the joys of the book is constantly s- snatching uh, defeat from the jaws of mm. victory, which is <laughs> exactly what I felt about my life, yeah. really. Um, I had a lot of opportunities, and some of them worked out and some of them didn't. But I do think that a certain modesty about one's abilities is more charming than uh, a certain vanity about them, and a vanity which may be misplaced, after mm. all. You know? I, so I, I don't think I lack self-confidence, really. Um, 
I think as I grew older and I realized just how bad an actor I was when I was young, mm -hmm. I think it began to be borne in on me that I'd had it very, very lucky. You know, it does help, I have to say, to look nice. And when I was young, I, I was quite cute. <laughs> and it does help. We all know that. Don't, There's no argument about it. Don't sell it, yourself you know? short. You're still quite cute. Well, <laughs> quite cute. Thank you. Well, it's awfully hard to be cute at my age. <laughs> but, but it does help. There's no question about it. And, and, and there's no question about it that one got roles, which maybe one shouldn't have done because mm. you look nice. You know? um, and, I, and I think one coasted. I coasted for years on that. Uh, giving what I thought were perfectly wonderful performances, but quite honestly, they, when looking back on them now, they were uh, merely adequate, really. Mm -hmm. And I started to learn my lesson, really, when I went back into the theatre after a fairly successful run on television and movies. I went back to the theatre, and, and I was given these huge, great leads. And I was in the West End of London playing leads, and my name was up on, in lights up there. And I thought, you've got to do something better than what you've been doing before. You can't just do that. You, you've got to do something more. And so I took a leaf out of Laurence Olivier's, when he said, as an actor, you have to if, surprise your audience. If you don't surprise them, they will despise you. You have to surprise them. So I started trying to, to surprise people. And I, I think that made me a better actor, really. You know? <laughs> Instead of giving people what they thought they were going to see, but, but yeah. change it and give it some well, new life. Just and try and be a little bit more exciting. And right. not, you know, I, yeah. Well, yeah. especially in the theater, because... because the great roles are going to be done over and over again, mm. so you have to give something different. To you bring to something yourself to it. Right, and that's yeah. what's yeah. what makes it. So I started better. trying to do that, and I think I got better, but it was a bit late in life. I mean, by then I was in my 40s, fair to say. You know, from in all 20s and 30s, I kind of coasted through it, and it was just too damn easy, frankly. You know, right. <laughs> It shouldn't have been, but it was too damn easy. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you talk about surprising an audience. What can you give me a, a, an idea of something a little more specific? Uh, it's something we could. Oh my God! What, something I have done? You mean as an actor? Maybe not what you've done, but if you were given that task, how would you surprise an audience? I mean, you've got a script. Yeah. People have heard these words over and over again. How do you bring some kind of surprise okay, to it? I, it may not necessarily be surprising them. I, I tell you, it's a little story. I played. <clears throat> Dick Dudgeon in The Devil's Disciple. It's a great star role that Shaw wrote, and it's one of the few great starring parts that, that really is a massive, great, wonderful role. And I did it up in Liverpool, and my then wife came and saw it. And afterwards, she was, you know, it's very good, yeah, it's very good. I said, it's Dick Dudgeon. Very good? Uh, she said, no, you were, you were very good, you were very good. I said, okay, come on. She said, well, I thought this was the star part. I said, it is. So she said, I just thought you were just another member of the company. Wham. Okay. Wow. <laughs> so the next time I did it, which was at the Trisha's Festival Theatre, which I did play the same part, I thought, it's the star role. You have to be the star. You have to come on and you have to make the audience, every single member of the audience, look at you. And you. I don't mean to say you should upstage no, or no, 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 steal no. from other people. Completely get but it. But you have to have some kind of something going on. You have to on. own it. And I think it's to do with energy and to do with the kind of vibration going on inside right, right. you, you know? Right. That's all. That's all, I, that's all I really mean by that. I mean, if you're playing the star role, you've got to be the star. It doesn't mean right. behave badly or be a pig or an asshole mm. to the other actor. It just means you've got to make sure that you're the center right. of attention. Right. If you're the lead character, you've got to lead the cast yes. in the production of it. Yes. Right. That's, yeah. that's really what it means. And I think that's up a great to then, I'd always been a good company member. Well, every now and again, you've got to be more than that, really, you know? Yeah. yeah. To stand out from the crowd. Yeah. 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 <laughs>